We'll hear argument first this morning in Case 09-1036, Henderson v. Shineski. Ms. Blatt. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The Federal Circuit's decision in this case forecloses judicial review when the very disability for which a veteran seeks benefits prevents the veteran from filing a timely appeal with the Veterans Court. That decision is wrong, and for three reasons, the Court of Appeals erred in holding that the deadline at issue in this case is jurisdictional. First, the statute contains no clear indication that the deadline is jurisdictional. Rather, the text and structure point away from a jurisdictional reading. Second, a deadline that applies to disabled and largely uncounseled veterans seeking their first day in court is not the type of deadline that Congress would be expected to rank as jurisdictional. And third, a jurisdictional reading would render some of the most disabled of veterans the least likely to obtain benefits and would treat veterans worse off than almost all litigants in our federal system. Ms. Blatt, you do have a substantial hurdle to contend with in this Court's decision in Bowles v. Russell, which seemed to say if you have a time limit and it's statutory, uh, it is mandatory and jurisdictional. So here we have uh, a time limit set by statute, not by rule. And um, why doesn't why isn't that dispositive? Because neither this court's decision in Bowles nor any other decision by this court holds that this type of appeal from a proclaimant and non-adversarial proceeding to a court of first review clearly speaks in jurisdictional terms, notwithstanding the lack of a jurisdictional label. Yeah, I thought Bowles was a nice, clear case. I mean, you can always find some distinction in the next case, and I thought the object of Bowles was to say if it's a, if it's a limit on appeal, it's jurisdictional. That would, and that's, I gather, what the uh, Federal Circuit took it to mean, and I would have done that if I was down there, probably. I mean, I can understand why maybe the Federal Circuit did it because of the one statement that the Court, I think, took out of context. But this Court's decision in Bowles didn't purport to extend to any statute, no matter what the statute said or what the context it arose in. And the most closely analogous context of an appeal of agency action to a court of first review is the Social Security context. And even if you don't think that that context is directly on point, then the historical backdrop at most would be inconclusive, and that hardly would rise. That, but doesn't, doesn't the Social Security context, uh, it doesn't speak of an appeal, does it? It talks of, of a civil action. That's you, right. You're, I mean, you're right that, uh, you know, that there, there, is a, there is a parallel in what's going on, but the statute does not call it an appeal. It calls it bringing a civil action to right. challenge and the, and the there's, decision. There's nothing inherently jurisdictional about the word appeal. And, Justice Scalia, if Congress that passed this statute wanted to pick up on the jurisdictional rule under 28 U.S.C. 2107, presumably it would have written a statute that looks something like that statute with the safety valves. Of course, when a, all litigants, civil litigants who are appealing a district court judgment to a court of appeals, uh, they have a jurisdictional deadline, but the district court can extend it for good cause or excusable neglect or when uh, the, the, the party lacks notice of an adverse judgment. Or importantly, the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure cure the situation when a litigant timely files his appeal but does so in the wrong form. In this statute, Congress knew how to incorporate the jurisdictional rule of Bowles. It did so in a separate provision of the statute in 7292A. It said when a litigant wants to go from the Veterans Court and appeal that decision to the Federal Circuit, the litigant has to follow the time and the manner prescribed for appealing district court judgments to court of appeals. And that is jurisdictional, 7292? Yes. Yes, and interestingly, it also goes on to say, if you want to appeal to this court, you have to apply for certiorari. So Congress so, — So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Go on. I, I'm not sure why Congress would have actually known the difference 
that we established in Bowles, because when it passed this statute, it was before Bowles, wasn't it? Yes. So what to read of its knowledge of Bowles, whether it meant jurisdictional or not, is, is — bit of a fiction, isn't it? No, I think what's important is that Bowles is relying on a series of decisions that had nothing to do with the word notice of appeal, of course, because they were dealing with cases involving writs of error and petitions for a writ of certiorari. It was all in the context of court-to-court appeals. Bowles doesn't even mention agency, appeal of agency action to a court of first review. So what's the rule? Justice Scalia said Bowles seemed to establish a sensible, clear rule, which is if Congress uses the word notice of appeal. It intends a jurisdictional restriction. Um, That appears to be the rule that Justice Scalia articulated. What would be your rule or test now to determine Congress's purpose? What what of our cases would you point to that establish a different rule? The rule of Reed Elsevier, which was a unanimous decision, which says, and it was written by the same author of Bowles, that all the decisions are consistent. You require a clear statement of jurisdictional intent. And in Bowles, this Court had read uh, the type of limitation that was at issue in Bowles as to clearly speak in jurisdictional terms, notwithstanding a label. Here, you have — I'm not sure what that distinction is. I'm sorry. You had a — What we relied on was the word notice of appeal in Bowles within a historical context. I don't think this Court said the word notice — a notice of appeal is not jurisdictional in the criminal context. And Congress used the word appeal throughout this particular statute in a non-jurisdictional meaning in all the proceedings that go in the agency. It used the term appellant and um, review on appeal. It's actually called the Board of Veterans Appeal, substantive appeal. None of those words have jurisdictional. And if Congress was just thinking of the word notice of appeal, it — I mean, the term has a non-jurisdictional meaning in the criminal context. But if you just look at this statute — which says it's directed just at the litigant's obligation to file a, a, his, his uh, appeal within a certain timeline. And there's actually a completely separate statute that speaks to the power of the court, the, the Veterans Court, uh, 7252A, and that makes no reference to the 120-day deadline. And I think in terms of the context, let's, this is exactly the type of deadline that Congress would be expected to be subject to equitable tolling. Now you, Let's give you the three you, reasons. You would um, have us make a uh, statute by statute determination as to what we think Congress intended whenever it uses the term notice of appeal. Um, and perhaps that's not a big problem if there are not a lot of other statutes like this one that use the term notice of appeal and with respect to which it's not settled whether it is jurisdictional. Do you have any sense of how many others there might be? Yeah, I think I found four that used the term notice of appeal, and it was in connection with the district court, and there weren't even reported cases. They were very esoteric situations like an order from the Department of Agriculture. I mean, maybe the government has different. What you mostly see is the Hobbs Act context, where you're talking about uh, either an organic statute or 28 U.S.C. 2344, which is just a simple uh, petition for review. That doesn't even use the word notice of appeal. So uh, this case is not going to dictate a whole lot except for the veterans context, where not only do you have the standard uh, lack of indication that this is not a jurisdictional, but you have the unique features in that Congress established this court to open the door to veterans seeking disability benefits, and it would just conflict with that purpose to at the same time shut the door when the veteran's disability prevents him from getting to the courthouse. Although that, although that would happen when he, <coughs> when he appeals from, uh, from the uh, Veterans Appeals Court, right? Yes, and that, but that points I, out the irony. He's in better off shape if he appeals to the Court of Appeals, because there, there's at least important exceptions. The government's position assumes that no matter what the circumstances were, and remember, a lot of these cases, the veteran is actually timely filing his appeal. He mistakenly files in the Veterans Administration rather than the Veterans Court. And the government's position assumes that these uncounseled veterans are simply out of time and out of luck with no exception. How much time does 7292 give to go from the Veterans Court to the Federal Circuit? It says you have to follow the exact time and procedure that is set forth in the process for, a pil- uh, 
for appealing a United States District Court decision to United States Courts of Appeals. So it is the procedures under 28 U.S.C. 2107. But, but this one, to get to the uh, Veterans uh, Court, is uh, 120 days, which is a lot of time. Uh, do, do, do you know of any other uh, time limit that is that long? Well, sure. I mean, the, the statute of limitations in Zipes, which is 180 days to file uh, a charge with the EEOC. But in the veterans' no, context, for, for appeal, for appeal. Right. Do you know of any it, other it, appeal statute? Yes, the it, veterans' it, context. The this is a blink of an eye, in the veterans' context. The veteran is given an entire year, not 120 days, a year after an initial decision comes down from a regional office to decide whether to appeal to the Boards of Veterans' Appeals. And you have to keep in mind that this is uh, the type of extra time we're talking about, an extra 30 to 60 days, would be an extremely poor and unlikely means for Congress to address the type of situation where equitable tolling might be needed, which is either because the Secretary has held on to the notice of appeal until after the 120 days and then tells the veteran, or the veteran has some uh, devastating mental illness and has difficulty with processing deadlines and uh, dealing with concepts. Well, the latter I can understand, but I, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for uh, — uh, I mean, when he loses below, he gets a notice that says specifically he has to file an appeal with this court, doesn't it? Doesn't it say that? Yes, and it so says — So he sends it — he sends it to the VA with, instead of to this court? Well, it is a — you can look w- it up. Would, would equitable tolling even cover that situation? It would seem to me. Uh, and I'd say it told you where to file. You simply didn't. Not only is the, has the Federal Circuit ruled on Bonk that it does, but this Court's decision in Irwin and in United States versus Young specifically recognized that a classic equitable tolling situation is when there's no prejudice to the other side and the litigate files in the wrong form. And you have to keep in mind there's a Federal rule of appellate procedure on point. Rule 4D says when a litigant mistakenly files his notice of appeal in the Court of Appeals, that's presumed to be correctly filed in the District Court. And for whatever you think about what, you're, what an average type person might see when they see a two-page single-space form with a lot of legalese, it's, this form is difficult for a lawyer to read. And to expect the vast majority of the claimants reading this form um, are uncounseled. And I I urge you to read the form. It doesn't just say you have 120 days to appeal. It goes on and on and on. It's cited in the government's brief. It's got the VA form, and I I had to look it up just by punching it on the Internet. But whatever you think about the clarity of someone of of your stature that might be able to understand it, time and time again, veterans file in the wrong form. And it's not always just the veteran's fault. Sometimes the secretary is giving the veteran misleading advice. We cite cases in our brief, and so do the amici, where the uh, Veterans Administration is giving the veteran um, just misleading advice. Mr. Black, you were making you, — you said the, the closest comparison is in the Social Security, let's say, disability benefits in both cases. Apart from that you com- one is commenced by a complaint filed in the district court, the other a notice of appeal, uh, is there any difference in the — brand of review. That is, as I understand, the Social Security review, although it's by the district court, is also on the administrative record. Well, it's purely appellate, and district courts always say when they get these things, this is an appeal of a Social Security decision. But I think the three reasons that I'm trying to get on why this is precisely the type of deadline that Congress would not rank as jurisdictional and would want to be subject to equitable tolling are the pretty much the reasons that apply even more so in the veterans' context. And that is the first, is that this is an extremely favored class of litigants. These are veterans who have fought for their country and who are seeking service-connected disability benefits. This is also the veterans' first opportunity to get to a court, which is true in the Social Security system. And importantly, the vast majority of veterans go to the court without counsel. The numbers are over 50 to 70 percent. And that was true in the Social Security system. I don't think that well, — counting — I appreciate all those points, but counting — cutting perhaps the other way is that it's not a real adversarial system before you get to that stage. Mm-hmm. It's a collaborative effort, the Veterans Administration and the, the individual, which right. seems to me may counterbalance a little bit the fact that the veterans are uncounseled. 
Well, I mean, uh, up until 2006, they were actually barred from having lawyers. But this is the same thing as the Social Security context, which is what this Court relied on unanimously in Bowen in holding that it's not jurisdictional. And it's also what this Court relied on in Zipes, is that you wouldn't expect Congress to enact an inflexible, harsh, no exceptions whatsoever, jurisdictional <coughs> when Congress presumably knew that the vast majority of people who would be navigating this system, coming out of this extremely informal adversarial system where the Secretary had a duty to actually assist the veteran, and then hitting what is then an adversarial system, um, and you would think that you would want equitable tolling. The well, they, they don't navigate it entirely unassisted. I mean, isn't there usually assistance from a, a non-governmental organization such as the American Legion? Or yes, in the Veterans Administration, not in Veterans Court. That's so right. 50 but, to 70 percent. Do, do, they, do they drop them like a hot, hot potato once the uh, — the VA portion is over. They don't counsel about how to file an appeal? That's correct, but I wouldn't say they drop them like a hot potato. These are um, people who are sitting in the VA, and they remember, like in this case, it's three years later, they don't even get notice of the final decision, which is just sent to the veteran. They don't have any kind of lawyer relationship. It's like someone at one of the VA offices who says, let me help you, tell you what to do, and then that's it. So, no, they don't — they don't — practice in veterans court. They don't, um, they don't say, you know, here's my card, let's keep in touch. And it might be three to four years later that a notice is sent to the veteran. And you think normally he, he isn't assisted, he is not assisted by one of these people? Well, I know that. The veterans court statistics says it's 70 percent. Pro se. Well, no lawyer. And the actual — I'm not talking about a lawyer. I'm talking about advice from somebody at, in the American Legion. Even if — okay, they're still not lawyers, but the uh, — the veterans assisted organizations who filed in this case are telling you they don't participate in veterans court. That's not what they do. They are set up in the VA system. I so think, I, it, unless I'm missing the point of my colleague's question, it's two different issues. Of course, they don't participate in court. They're not, they're not lawyers. But it's not clear to me why they wouldn't participate, at least in the process of saying, You've got to file your notice, and here's where you file it. Are, are you saying they don't do that? They, by and large, don't do that, and the veterans organizations that filed amicus brief say they also make the same mistake. They're not lawyers, and they often file in the wrong form, too. But, again, what's, what's — I mean, they do it regularly, and they — every now and then they file it in the wrong place? Yes. I mean, half the cases that we, you know — Well, I don't see how that works. You've got somebody there, and he's been telling them where to file it and file it and file it, and all of a sudden he tells them to file it someplace else? Again, as far as I am aware, they don't counsel veterans after they get Earlier, Ms. Black, you said that uh, they wouldn't even know. They wouldn't, right. Because so, they don't get notice, only the veterans. Right. They wouldn't get notice. It would be someone would have to have a, some sort of relationship and call that person. But uh, in this case, I mean, I can tell you there was no the, — the veteran just had his, his wife, and there was no one else involved in the process other than his doctors. But what in happens terms of, if, the, if the veteran doesn't get notice? Well, he's out of luck, according to the government. That's just tough. But, a again, it's, it's thinking about and remember that uh, not only is there a clear statement rule in types of, of jurisdiction, but we have a uh, equally strong canon that uh, veteran statutes are to be construed uh, liberally in the — what, 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 what clear statement rule are you talking about? Just the rule of um, Reed Elsevier and Arbaugh, that unless a statute clearly speaks in jurisdictional terms. Yeah, I, know, I remember that. I remember that. I thought that it, that was a prospective bright line rule. It's kind of hard to apply a new bright line rule retrospectively. I understood what we said in those cases to be look, Congress, we're tired of trying to sort out this ambiguity. From now on, if you want it to be treated as jurisdictional, tell us it's jurisdictional. That makes sense prospectively, but it doesn't make sense to do that to statutes that were passed before we announced our bright line preference. Well, it, it doesn't make sense to say in 1988 Congress was trying to map onto some, some pre-existing structure that didn't exist. Bowls didn't exist. You no, I'm trying — I understand changing the subject, but in my question, you invoked the bright line rule of Arbaugh that the statute should say jurisdictional. And I'm just saying that only makes sense prospectively. I can see your point. I don't think that that's what Arbaugh intended. I think it said that when you have a statutory requirement, 
and when it doesn't speak to the jurisdiction of the court, there's no reason to think that it should restrict the jurisdiction of the court. This doesn't it's say anything even, about the court's power. Are you uh, — we have in, in Bowles itself, it was um, — from the District Court to the Court of Appeals, and then we have from the Court of Appeals to this Court, uh, those two provisions were cited in Bowles, the 2107, and what is the provision for, for cert? 2101. 2101. Those, those, as far as I remember, were the only provisions that were cited. Well, and the predecessor is called writ of error. Right. They were — I mean, this couldn't be further from it. Congress, when it passed this statute, said you have 120 days to file your appeal. And then in a whole — and said — didn't say anything about the jurisdiction. And a separate provision said, here's the jurisdiction, and we'll incorporate some procedural requirements, but we're not even going to mention the 120-day deadline. And then it goes to great pains to say 2107 will apply when you appeal from the Veterans Court to the Federal Circuit, and you'll have to apply for certiorari. But to think about what the government's position is, is that notwithstanding that criminal defendants and Social Security claimants do not face jurisdictional deadlines, all the civil litigants in our system who do face jurisdictional deadlines can get an extension for good cause, excusable neglect when they don't have a notice of an adverse judgment, and the situation is cured when they actually timely file, but they mistakenly file in the wrong Whenever form. we have uh, time limits uh, in the future that do not contain any, uh, uh, any explicit uh, provision for waiver of failure to meet those time limits, you're asking us to find that all of those are non-jurisdictional? Well, all statute of limitations are not jurisdictional. So there's no question — Well, this is a filing requirement. It's, it's, uh, it, well, it's an appeal. It, it, it's a requirement for appeal. Whenever there is an appeal deadline that does not have an exception for — you know, uh, you, you, you can get it extended for 10 days or whatnot. Whenever there's no exception, you want us to hold it's not jurisdiction. No, of course not. Like I just said, I don't know of any that even come up except for, I think I found four that say notice of appeal. All the types of cases that you see are dealing with a petition for review of agency action, a la the Hobbs Act context. So what I'm asking you to hold is that when you have a — this particular statute, which the text and structure certainly say it's not jurisdictional, it is exactly the, the ty- is not the type of deadline you would expect it, and it would undermine all of the purposes that Congress set up this court, which was to ensure they have their day in court, they get the benefits they are entitled to, and importantly, to cure the perception that veterans would be tre- not being treated the way all other claimants seeking federal benefits were. This would completely counter that purpose to say, here's a court. We've built it for you, but if you can't get up the courthouse steps, that's too bad. If your very disability prevents you from filing or you've been abused by the VA, the VA bureaucracy, you're out of luck and out of court. Although you're willing to, to allow that to happen when there's an appeal from, from the first appeal, And, and right? here's why, Justice Scalia, the veteran has had a day in court. Once he is out of the veteran's court, he is like every or she is like every other litigant in our federal system, which the deadline applies to the government, the deadline applies to the party, to any party. That's 2107, which applies to all civil litigants equally. They've had their day in court, and if it's in the Hobbs Act context, usually they've had some sort of adversarial court-like proceeding in the administrative agency. But no decision — And again, keep in mind there were three decisions in the Social Security context. No decision has ever said a proclaimant, non-adversary appeal to a court of first review is jurisdictional. So Congress was acting against that backdrop. And that was was the Federal Circuit's position until Bowles, right? Because this was an end bank decision, and it overruled two prior cases. Right. They did go back and forth. So there was a period of six years that they held it was jurisdictional, and then a period of 11 years the last 11 years where it's been non-jurisdictional and there's been equitable tolling. If a veteran is so profoundly disabled that the veteran can't file the notice of appeal within 120 days after the notice of the decision, at what point after the 120-day period would uh, the the right to file a notice of appeal be cut off? Would this go on potentially indefinitely? No. I mean, in, in adopting equitable tolling by the Federal Circuit for mental disabilities, 
um, that case is Barrett versus Principi on page 9 of our brief. It goes through how all the sister circuits have dealt with the issue of mental disability um, in Title VII in the Social Security system and, and, and how you would deal with that. But let's take this case because it's a good example. The doctor said he was uh, — he's paranoid schizophrenic, so he's having periods and what it's a quote the doctor that was submitted to the Veterans Court. He had episodes of what was basically called psychomotor retardation and total inability to function. And at other times, he was just simply disorganized, had difficulty with recall and memory. So he wrote a handwritten note within 15 days saying, I've been on and off. Uh, and he was obviously extremely heavily medicated. If I could reserve the balance of my time. Thank you, counsel. <laughs> Mr. Miller. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. In Bowles against Russell, this Court reaffirmed its longstanding treatment of statutory time limits for the taking of appeals as jurisdictional. Mm -hmm. Section 7266A imposes a 120-day time limit on the taking of an appeal to the Veterans Court, and under the rule reaffirmed in Bowles, that time limit is a limit on the Court's jurisdiction, and the judgment of the Court of Appeals should therefore be affirmed. So is it only — I'm sorry. Of course, in Bowles, it was — from an Article III court to another Article III court. Um, here, although we're dealing with an Article I court, there are characteristics of what you might call internal agency review. The court is specialized with respect to veterans' affairs, and there are particular um, standards for uh, review that you don't find when you're talking about between the district court and the Court of, court of Appeals. Well, I, 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 and I guess it, it, it's related, just to get everything out on the table, it's related to the same point that I thought it was significant in Bowles that you're dealing with a time limitation that lawyers had long recognized as being, you know, a drop-dead date. Uh, that, that is true, but what Bowles emphasized was not just the historical treatment of the particular time limit in Section 2107, but the historical treatment of statutory time limits for appeals in general, which is why the Court cited not only 2107. It didn't pages, mention, but Bowles didn't mention anything uh, like a, an appeal from an agency where the uh, district court is, is sitting uh, essentially as an appellate court. And Bowles really was dealing with court to court because it mentioned 2107 and 2101, and I don't recall that it mentioned any anything other than court-to-court situations. Well, you're, you're correct that Bowles was focused on court-to-court appeals, but, of course, in, in Stone against INS, uh, which involved the deadline for petitioning for review of a final decision of the Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, the Court held that that uh, time limit was jurisdictional. So I think that the same principle applies to appeals. Except that, that one is an adversarial proceeding, the immigration proceeding, and the veterans is supposed to be uh, claimant friendly, but I think that the the uh, Justice Bowles is is a is a challenge for Ms. Blatt. So for you, is the Social Security context because it seems to me the quality of review is the same. That is, what the district court does in a Social Security disability case is the same thing that the Veterans Court does in a veteran's disability case. It is true that functionally the review that takes place uh, under Section 405G has a lot of appeal-like features. Uh, but what's — and so in that sense, you know, Bowen was, I think, a hybrid case because uh, you have something that looks a little bit like an appeal, uh, but it takes place in a district court and in a court of original jurisdiction. And most importantly, uh, Congress referred to it as a civil action that is commenced uh, by the party. But it is, it is an, an appellate review, isn't it? I mean, the district court goes on the record before the agency. The, 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 the review is very much like, uh, functionally, like what would happen in, in the Court of Appeals. But Congress chose to call it commencing a civil action. And you commence it by filing a complaint, which is quite different from the notice of appeal here. Uh, the notice of appeal is uh, there's a form for doing it, or if you don't use the form, it, all it takes is one sentence. Uh, Are we supposed I, to still pay some attention to what we think Congress would have intended? Uh, certainly. All right. If the answer is certainly, how likely do you think it is that Congress would have intended its statutes in an ordinary case where two big businesses are suing each other and they've already had a day in court and now one of them wants to appeal and Congress writes in 
if you miss the deadline, you can have it extended through excusable neglect. And you can even have it extended much later if nobody got a notice. That's with two big businesses. But if you have someone who served his country and was wounded and has post-traumatic stress syndrome or schizophrenia, to that person, you say, who has never had a day in court, if you don't meet the deadline, you're out, no matter how excusable it is. How, who in Congress would have likely fought such a thing? Well, I, I think in, in evaluating what Congress thought in, in 1988, one factor that's significant is that this was taking place, the, the, the Veterans Judicial Review Act, against a backdrop of decades of no judicial review whatsoever uh, of veterans, uh, of VA administrative decisions. And so petitioner's position is that uh, essentially Congress in one fell swoop went from no review whatsoever to what would be the most forgiving appeal deadline in the entire United States Code. And and it made some sense. When you look at the statistics, when you get into this court, the veterans almost always win, right? I I think when when you look at decisions uh, on the merits uh, as opposed to agreed upon remands, uh, the veterans win in in most cases. What is the relevance of, of that? If the veterans win, I mean, perhaps they're entitled to win. Uh, is the idea that you would cut off their right to appeal because you're afraid they'd win? Uh, of course not. I, I mean, I my, my point was the exact, exact opposite, that if, you, if they almost always win, you assume Congress wouldn't want to cut them off because it's, it's — you know, if only 1 percent of the veterans appealing win, you might understand an absolute rule because they're not, as statistically anyway, not losing much. But if, as I understand to be the case, about 80 percent of them win, uh, you might cut them a little slack on appealing because it is a very significant part of the, the process. Sorry. First, I would say I think the, the reversal rate is not um, necessarily out of line with what you find in other uh, agency review contexts. But what, what is, is the reversal rate? Uh, I think uh, of cases uh, that are decided on the merits, uh, about a quarter are reversed and remanded and about 34 percent are affirmed in part and reversed in part. Any idea what the normal rule is from district court to court of appeals? I, I don't know the, the percentage there, but I, I think in considering that rate, it's significant that the great majority of claimants uh, who file claims in the regional office uh, are given relief there. And so only about 4 percent of cases uh, are even appealed all the way from the regional office to the board, and only another 9 percent to the Veterans Court. So. Uh, because the, the board gives uh, relief in most cases before it. Mr. So it's Miller, do, do, you, do you really think Congress thought about this? Do, do you think the members of Congress who voted for this bill thought about this, this rather narrow point about whether if you file too late it's jurisdictional or not? Uh, there's no indication that they did. So don't we pretty much have to go on what they wrote? Uh, yes, and w- w- when, when they wrote uh, a notice of appeal provision, and it is clear from the text uh, as well as from the history that it is, in fact, uh, an appeal that was a considered well, decision. a dollar to a donut that, that nobody thought about this narrow, narrow issue. So it, it ought to be a question of, of what this language ought to be taken to mean, what's its fairest reading. Now, I'm not sure that means you win, but, uh, but surely that's the issue, not, not what, you know, whether, whether Congress could have been so mean. They didn't think of this. Right. And, and, and in looking at I, what you mean, right, I thought within — first of all, do, a, do, a donut costs a dollar, so I don't see much <laughs> deal there. But, but uh, uh, don't we, throughout the statute books, try to work out from context, language, and uh, objective purpose what a reasonable member of Congress would have intended, whether they thought about it or whether they did think about it, which would require X-rays into the brain that have not yet been invented? What this Court has held in, in Bowles uh, on the one hand and Irwin on the other is that uh, statutory notice of appeal deadlines are presumptively jurisdictional and statutes of limitation are presumptively but not. But that's court and, to court. Do you well, have any case um, at the time or before the statute was passed that ever held that a statutory deadline from an agency to a court appeal was jurisdictional in the sense of Bowles. Uh, Stone against INS, which was after. Uh, Well after. But but, uh, in the Courts of Appeals, uh, there was a long history of cases under the Hobbs Act, uh, uh, cases under more specialized statutes, the Communications Act, the Federal Power Act, and the Environmental Statutes. But those Uh, had different language. They used barred language rather than 
Uh, filing language, most of those. No. In, in fact, the Hobbs Act says uh, a, a party aggrieved by the order may seek review by filing a petition for review. It, it doesn't say anything about, and a claim shall be barred if you well, don't. Bowles itself uh, made, a, made a major point, which I thought was relevant, though I didn't join it. I thought it was relevant. And that is, we look at the statute, if you're looking at the statute, and notice that there are exceptions written into it. And the fact that there are exceptions written into it lends some support to the notion that we, as a Court, should not read other exceptions into it that weren't mentioned. Now, that's something the Court seemed to emphasize. And here, when I looked at this statute, I noticed there are no exceptions written into it. And therefore, following Bowles, rather than rejecting Bowles, it would seem that Bowles would support the reading of this statute to allow courts to read into it because they don't mention anything themselves. Well, I, I would say two things about that. The, the first is that there are many statutes, uh, including the Hobbs Act, uh, the immigration uh, statute, that have no provision for exceptions. Uh, this Court's certiorari de deadline can be extended by a justice, but there's no uh, provision for a good cause exception. Sure. Uh, the extension provision that was specifically at issue in Section 2107 in Bowles uh, hadn't, wasn't even enacted until uh, 1991. And even with an extension, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, other provision that gives you as much as 120 days uh, that you have here. That's the main uh, thing. If, leaving that out for a second, if you, if you thought there can't be a rule that governs all of the thousands of different or many different statutes, you should look at the context. So sometimes you will see that Congress, given the context, probably did want to give the Court some leeway to make exceptions, where, for example, it's no fault of the litigant. And in other instances, they didn't. Now, you've listed — and Bowles, I thought, left that open. But, but if it does leave it open, and I'm looking to those factors, you've mentioned one, that this is a long period of time, 120 days. You're right about that. Is there anything else? Well, I mean, I, I, I guess I would take issue with the premise of, of what the presumption is that Bowles set up. Bowles established a presumption that notice of appeal deadlines in statutes are jurisdictional unless there is something in the text uh, or in the history, uh, as for example. And what they found, understand. one thing in the text, was that there were exceptions written in. That cuts against you. Well, the, one thing cuts for you. That's the length of time. Uh, although, Is there anything else that cuts for you? I just want to be sure I have all of the factors that you're weighing. I mean, I, I, what we're emphasizing is that uh, this is an appeal deadline, and in Bowles, although it is true that there were exceptions there, uh, that was not uh, something that the Court emphasized in its reasoning. The, the Court's — the, the rationale uh, behind Bowles is that there's a presumption uh, that appeal deadlines are jurisdictional. And whatever what, one what thinks — What happens if the uh, — if the notice of decision is — mistakenly mailed to the wrong address, comes back uh, undeliverable, and no further notice is sent. Your, your position is once the 120 days expires, uh, the veteran is out of luck? Uh, no, Your Honor, because in that case, the 120 days wouldn't start running, because uh, Section 7266A uh, says you have to file within 120 days uh, after the date on which notice of the decision is mailed pursuant to Section 7104E. Uh, and Section 7104E in turn requires that the notice be mailed uh, to the address of record for uh, the claimant, and, and also incidentally requires that if the claimant has an authorized representative uh, in proceedings before the board, that the notice also be mailed to the representative. All right, but what if it's just lost in the mail? What if it's sent to the right address, but it's lost in the mail or is not received by the veteran? Um, what, yeah. what is the veteran supposed to do? Uh, call every every week to see whether a decision has been issued? And I, I, I think Congress, in writing the statute, uh, assumed that the mail can be relied upon in the ordinary course to be delivered. Um, and it, so it made provision for the case in which the mail — the mailing is not made. You, you say uh, that a copy of the notice is also sent to the uh, representative of the American Legion or whoever who has been representing the uh, — yeah, the veteran? Section uh, 7104E2 says that uh, if the claimant has a representative, a copy is mailed. In what percentage of the cases uh, is there a representative? I, I think it's uh, about 80 uh, percent. Oh, uh, well, I, I, I uh, sense some confusion here, given what you and your friend have said. What do you mean when you say counseled? Do you mean — I mean, if you have 
somebody from the American Legion that is telling this person, here's what you need to do, does he get a notice? Or are you talking about just a situation where somebody comes in and it's, um, well, I'm this person's lawyer or I'm representing him in some other way? Uh, the, the, there is a procedure for uh, official accreditation of representatives right. uh, from organizations like the American Legion. And if that person is registered as the claimant's representative in the proceeding before the board, and then they would get a copy of the notice uh, under 7104. And you, say, and you say that 80 percent of the time there is a registered uh, yes, the, that, that's, advocate or counsel. Yes. Um, now, I, I think as I was — But what happened in this case? It was, it, was there a registered uh, representative? I, I'm, I'm not sure whether there was. I, I don't believe so. You, you made a point earlier that, well, this is — the Social Security, there are m many resemblances, but one is started by a complaint and the other by notice of appeal. It could be that Congress, having been so kind to veterans, thought, why should we burden this pro se or at least lawyerless veteran with writing out a complaint? A notice of appeal is just a simple one-line document. So could that explain why Congress said you begin with a notice of appeal instead of a formal complaint? I think that may well be uh, what Congress had in mind. But uh, nonetheless, the, the, the rule uh, established in this Court's cases is that when a notice of appeal deadlines, and, and I think that point just illustrates that this is, in fact, a notice of appeal deadlines, notice of appeal deadlines uh, are different from statutes and limitations. And whatever uh, one thinks of the original theoretical underpinnings of that distinction, it's a distinction that's firmly ingrained in the law. And this — And, I think and Congress — uh, uh Let's assume uh, we, we come out with a decision against the veteran. Could Congress change the rule retroactively, in, including for this poor fellow? It, it could, uh, if it chose to do so, yes. And that wouldn't uh, be contrary to uh, any of our decisions because the government is the defendant and is essentially waiving its sovereign immunity? Would that be the, the theory? I, I think if, if Congress — I mean, there, there, there has been, will have been a final decision in this case, right? Yes. So can Congress say, you know, go back and do it over again and, and give it to this guy? I, I believe that, it, you know, it, since what's at stake is uh, the, the, ultimately the question would be whether the government issues a, a monetary award uh, to him, and Congress certainly has the power to simply direct that uh, money be paid to this claimant. So uh, for sure, I think it could direct that uh, his case be reopened. But there's no, been no determination on the merits whether this claimant should prevail. No. That, that hasn't been aired well, because the Veterans Court said it had no jurisdiction, and the Federal Circuit said that's right. So we don't know if this is a good or bad claim. Right. Uh, but I so Congress couldn't just award money because there has to be an adjudication. Well, Congress would have the constitutional power to just award money. Uh, I, I, I had understood Justice Scalia's question. Justice to be Scalia, whether. I think, <laughs> asked you, uh, could this be, if Congress uh, decided that this was a harsh result, could it be made <laughs> retroactive? But for Congress to say, well, just what is, is it going to rely on to say whether it gives compensation or not? I mean, the government's position was he wasn't entitled to compensation for home care, which is what he was seeking. Right. I, I mean, the, the, the question I was trying to address was whether uh, Congress could uh, amend the statute so as to retroactively reopen uh, uh, petitioner's claim. And uh, my answer was yes, it, it could do that uh, if it were to choose to do so. Now, the, the VA, of course, has uh, submitted a proposal uh, to Congress uh, for uh, an extension of the period on showing of good cause up to 120 days. Uh, the VA's proposal would not apply retroactively, but Congress, in its discretion, could choose. Uh, on the length of time, maybe <coughs> you said 120 days, yes, that's a long time. But isn't it uh, on search, it's 90 days plus 60, right? So that's even longer. Right. Although if you — I mean, if somebody who misses 
the 90 days. Uh, my understanding of the operation of this Court's Rule 13 is that the clerk will not accept for filing a petition filed on day 91. But the, the total number of days would exceed 120, it, assuming that the application is made. The right, application although, extend, to extend is timely. Although, of course, filing a, a cert petition is uh, a much greater undertaking uh, than filing a notice of appeal. Uh, you have to uh, much more than a simple, uh, simple one-line document. That, that what, what is supposed to happen? Uh, you know, and I've probably seen this in the page 16 of the uh, uh, Federal Circuit bars, amicus brief. They list about 30 or 40 cases where the veteran perhaps wasn't represented and maybe had some stress syndrome, whatever it is. He just filed the paper in the wrong court. And the, or the wrong uh, agency, and that agency didn't get around to returning it to him in time, so he could have met this deadline. What's, what, in your opinion, is supposed to happen in those circumstances? Just say, too bad, you're out of luck. Here we are. Uh, you you sent, got, got the wrong address. Um, no recovery. Well, I, I think it's significant that Congress uh, did address uh, the, the question of mailing of notices of appeal. Uh, in 1994, it amended Section 7266 and added uh, a subsection C, uh, which unfortunately is not reproduced in the briefs. But that, the effect of that is to give the benefit of a mailbox rule so that a petition is deemed filed uh, on the day it is mailed, uh, but only, quote, if the notice is properly addressed to the court. So it's significant. Well, all these cases, actually, that they've raised in the brief, the, the veteran does get his appeal. Uh, well, uh, no, in those cases, the notice w would not have been properly addressed to the court. It would have been so, so they can somewhere do it else. Again. And certainly one would, That's good. What one would hope that the VA, uh, you know, ideally would get those uh, notices, figure out what they are, and send them to the court. Uh, the problem that the VA encounters is that uh, it receives a tremendous volume of mail, which is not generally opened by attorneys, uh, and it's often not clear when it gets something in the mail uh, if it just says, you know, I, I don't like the decision in my case, uh, whether that's a notice of appeal to the court or a motion for reconsideration or a, a motion well, to These people in footnote 3, did they get their appeal or didn't they? Uh, they, they did not. Uh, they did not? Yeah. Okay. And there is a problem. Well, yeah, and we, we, we do not deny, and in fact it's true by definition, that to say that there is no equitable tolling um, is to say that there will be cases in which the result is not equitable. Uh, but, and I think if you were to look at just the cases like the ones Your Honor has identified, some of the others in petitioner's brief and in the amicus briefs, and if you could identify with no transaction costs uh, what those cases are and were to ask as a policy matter, should there be, uh, should the late filing be excused in those cases, I think just about everyone would say yes. And so if we're in a void and the language doesn't have the exceptions, and I think you can distinguish it from these other cases, and you have older cases that says unless Congress is clear, read it as non-jurisdictional, and nobody could say it was inequitable, or rather to the contrary, nobody could say it was equitable to follow your position here, why isn't there a simple remedy? We take the opposite position. Well, I, I think there, there are two answers to that. And the, the first is that it, whatever you think of uh, the rule in Bowles, and we obviously uh, believe that it was correctly decided, but I understand that not everyone uh, takes that view. Well, but I the, accept that for purposes of this. It governs. I'm just looking at the parts of it that did, in fact, make clear a special nature of the particular provision uh, at issue in that case. But the, the, the question of whether uh, a particular time limit is or is not jurisdictional would seem to be a quintessential example of the sort of issue where it is more important that the law be settled uh, than that it be settled any particular way. And the great virtue of the rule in Bowles is that it provides clear guidance that appeal deadlines are going to be presumed to be jurisdictional, and if Congress doesn't want them to be, uh, it can That's say That's really the or only thing that counsels your result, because in re you took the government took the position that a statutory provision is non-jurisdictional if it does not speak in jurisdictional terms um, and doesn't address the power of the court. I understand that was the government's position in Reed. Today you're saying that the only thing that counsels your result is the fact that Congress used the words notice of appeal. Is that correct? Yes, our, our position is consistent with what we said in Reed, because Reed, of course, did not involve uh, a time limit. Uh, Reed involved uh, the requirement that 
uh, copyrights be registered before an infringement action is brought. Uh, and what the Court said in Reed is that the presence or absence of a jurisdictional label uh, on the statute is not determinative. Uh, what's, what matters is whether the type of limitation that the statute imposes is one that's properly ranked as jurisdictional, absent a label. Is, is there any, any statute uh, on the time to appeal? Has any statute been held, quote, jurisdictional when there is no safety valve of any kind written into it? That is, the 2101, 2107, their extensions are possible. Uh, is, is there a, quote, jurisdictional statute that says 121 days or whatever, and that's it, no extension, no matter what the circumstances are? Yes. The, the Immigration and Nationality Act, at issue in Stone, has no provision for extensions. <clears throat> uh, the Hobbs Act has no provision for extensions. Uh, and the, many of the various agency-specific statutes uh, that I mentioned earlier don't have any provisions for extensions. And although this Court hasn't ruled on them, uh, petitioner hasn't identified any decision from any court of appeals uh, holding that any of those statutes is not jurisdictional. Uh, so there really is, uh, as recognized in Bowles, a uniform rule uh, regarding uh, time limits for the taking of appeals uh, and, and proceedings like appeals, writs of certiorari and petitions for appeals. Uh, what, what other acts do you think would be swept up into a rule that we adopted here that uh, not all limitations on appeal time uh, are jurisdictional? The Hobbs Act cases, what else? Uh, the, the, well, I mean, which ones would be swept up, I suppose, depends on what the Court were to say uh, in, in distinguishing uh, this case. But there, there's the Hobbs Act, the uh, — Well, I mean, I am sure we'd say these are veterans, but, but I'm sure there, there are other cate categories of sympathetic people who, who might come under the Hobbs Act. There, there, there might well be, and I, I think that's why one of the, the virtues of the rule in Bowles is that it provides clear guidance to Congress, yeah. and in that respect, uh, it is much preferable to a rule that statutes limit. Uh, yeah, statutes you haven't answered my question. Oh, uh, well, Hobbs Act, the, the Hobbs Act, uh, the Federal Power Act, the Communications Act, uh, various EPA orders uh, are reviewed under their specific. Each statute has its own. Uh, review. All these agency matters are matters where there's never been a judicial input. This is review of an agency action. The agency takes an action. No judge has looked at this. And uh, the first time that you look at the rulemaking by the agency under the Hobbs Act, I guess, is when you go file it in the, in the court. So if a, if a ruling against you here were to encompass a ruling under most review of agency action, would that be such a terribly unworkable thing? Ooh. Well, I, I, I suppose that the Court could uh, come up with uh, a rule. Whether that would prove to be workable, I, I, I don't know. But I, I think um, — I guess what I would say about that is that the, given that uh, there is an inherent arbitrariness to any filing deadline, and therefore there is — to some degree, an inevitable arbitrariness in any system of exceptions to the final Why wouldn't it be a bright, clear line if we said court to court, Bowles controls. Agency to court, Bowles does not control. That would be a clear line. It, it would be clear, but it would be contrary to Stone. It would be contrary to decades of uniform holdings from courts of appeals under uh, all the other. Well, Stone was somewhat mixed, though. It was uh — a motion for reconsideration of the agency, whether or not that told the time to go to the court. Am I correct? That, that, that's right, Your Honor. So that's a, a, sort of a hybrid problem uh, in the context of Justice Ginsburg's dichotomy. But, uh, I mean, you're, you're right that that was the issue in Bowles, but uh, — excuse me, in Stone. But the reason that that mattered in Stone was because the Court held uh, that the timely filing uh, of a petition for review in compliance with the statute uh, was a prerequisite to the exercise of jurisdiction uh, by the Court of Appeals. The case that goes the other case that you said decades is what is an example of a case where a person for an incredible, equitable, strong reason, such as the wind the blue is paper, I don't know, some tremendously equitable, strong reason he wants review of an agency. The, the dog ate it, maybe. Yeah. Right, right. Well, the dog ate the court. And the 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 the, the, uh, the 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 there is a case which says there is no extension 
of a, of a deadline to file for review of an agency action, no matter how equitable your case. Which, which is our — which is the Supreme Court case that holds that? I, I am not familiar with it, but that, I, I don't know one in the specific context of agency actions, but of course — No, I'm only talking about agency not, actions. A, judicial review of agency action. If, if the time limit is jurisdictional, as the — Well, I know the rule, but I'm just saying you no — I understand the rule. I'm saying what's the case? Stone, I, I understand you can make a case of stone. Is there another? I, I, I don't know of any from this Court, but, of course, in the Courts of Appeals, uh, Petitioner hasn't identified any in which uh, an exception was made. And I would point out that Bowles, uh, the, in Bowles, the Petitioner uh, had a very sympathetic equitable claim in that he had done what the District Court told him to do uh, and filed on the schedule uh, given to him by the District Court, and the Court nonetheless held uh, that because the time limit was jurisdictional, uh, there was no authority to create an exception to it. If there are no further questions, we ask that the judgment be affirmed. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Ms. Blatt, you have four minutes remaining. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Let me just point out on the Hobbs Act, the actual statute says uh, the jurisdiction is invoked by filing a timely petition uh, for review. So there's an express jurisdictional hook. And I think Justice Scalia points out an interesting fact on I think it's safe to say in 1988 Congress wasn't sitting around thinking, is this deadline jurisdictional or subject to equitable tolling? What we had is a period where veterans were not given judicial review. We had World War II and the Vietnam conflict and the Korean conflict, which made it just untenable that veterans were not being treated on par with other uh, claimants seeking disability benefits. And the sponsor of the bill points out, since Social Security disability benefits get judicial review, how can we not treat our nation's veterans the same? Uh, now, counsel, I, I want to clear up this represent, represented sure. business. I understood you to say in the, the, your opening that represented — most of these people are not represented, and they're rep, to the extent the American Legion participates, they don't get notice of the uh, order that triggers the 120 days. And I understood Mr. Miller to tell us that 80 percent of the people have registered representatives, and they do get notice. Right. I think you correctly understand that we have a different understanding of reality. So my understanding is that uh, representation is uh, — like the, the — Mr. Henderson's wife at one point tried to become his authorized representative. Mm -hmm. There is no question he had somebody helping him, a veteran service organization right. process. This can take up to four or five years right. to get notice. My was that person helping him registered as a representative? No, not that I know of. But this is not — Well, is that the exception, then? I mean, Mr. Miller tells us 80 percent of the people do have registered representatives. Right. I understand. And I'm, I'm just telling you that my understanding from not only just the amici briefs, that they do not have anything to deal with the court, is that um, the veterans' organizations don't have notice. They are the ones that are filing in this case telling you that this decision will be disastrous for them. But even if they do — they are uncounseled. They are not lawyers. But it won't be disastrous if they can ask to be registered. I agree, but these are um, — the Veterans Service, like in, in this case, where the, he lives in, in North Carolina, there's only like 50 VA regional offices. So his representative may be 100, 200 miles away, and there's not that kind of connection. <laughs> but if the case comes — It doesn't matter how far away they are if he gets — they don't — Notice. I understand, and I'm just — my understanding is that they either — they don't get notice, and even if they have notice, they have — feel no obligation, because they're not in a representative capacity at that point, that they would process his appeal or advise him. Well, why give them notice? I mean, isn't the very giving of, of right. notice and, just, an indication that they're expected to and do And I something? understand the government representing that there's notice, and I'm telling you that is not my understanding, that when he said authorized representative — I don't think that that meant veterans serving this organization. I may be wrong. It sounds like we have a different understanding. But if I can get back on to what is really before this Court, is that when there's no indication, all we have is the three words, notice of appeal, when we know that those three words are non-jurisdictional in the criminal context, that there's nothing jurisdictional about the word notice of appeal, it accurately describes that an appeal is going on. It doesn't say anything about whether the deadline is jurisdiction. And the question is, was Congress thinking about 
the type of uh, people who appeal district courts to courts of appeals. Yes, they were, but they made separate provisions for that. Or were they thinking about the Hobbs Act, which deals with the licensing of nuclear power plants and orders by the FCC, and has an express statement in the text that it's jurisdictional? Uh, I doubt that — I think it is safe to say that Congress was not thinking about any of those contexts. They were trying to give veterans their day in court. And this decision would say — uh, no matter what the circumstances are, they are deprived. Now, there was some discussion on the 120-day deadline. I think another thing that is very safe to say is that time is not of the essence in the veteran system. It never has been. 120 days is a blink of an eye. It's true that Social Security are given 60 days and other appellates are giving 30. Are you helped or hurt in making that argument when this is not de novo review? I think you're helped. If it's not de novo review, that helps. Yeah, there's no prejudice.